Great, thank you. Thank you all for being here. And um, uh, as Juan and I were talking about, this is one of the most iconic images probably of the space age. I would say that everything that went before this time of 57, 58 was prologue, and really the scientific space age began with the launch by the Soviet Union of the Sputnik satellites and, the, uh, and then the Explorer satellites by the US. I'm going to, this is not such a scientific talk, it's more of a, a history talk and a political talk about the conditions during those times. For those who were alive and remember it, who can correct my, my telling of this history, I welcome that, uh, but I'm going to try to go through sort of uh, the genesis of the Soviet program, the U.S. program, and how it came to be that the Van Allen belts were the Van Allen belts. The, most of the people in Russia, Germany, and the United States who uh, we would consider the pioneers of rocketry and of the uh, development of satellite systems, um, when interviewed and talked uh, to about this, really went back to their, their influence, the influence of uh, science fiction writers, Jules Verne here, and H.G. Wells, and what a big influence this had on their lives, uh, the uh, idea that uh, satellites could be sent around the Earth or that humans could be sent to the moon or to other planets. Some of these were very optimistic um, views of the space, possibility of space age. Some were much more sinister and dark, but uh, nonetheless, the idea that humans would expand beyond uh, the Earth's surface into space was uh, very much the theme. The uh, first I want to talk about is Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. Um, he was born in Tsarist Russia and worked uh, into the time of the uh, Soviet era in, uh, in the Soviet Union. And um, he was a teacher and uh, had a very strong influence through his uh, sort of relentless advocacy for developing of space uh, flight systems. Um, he uh, lived uh, until 1935 and was uh, honored, of course, by the, um, by the uh, Soviet system for the uh, strong advocacy that he had for uh, space flight. Um, on the U.S. side, there was Robert Goddard, um, somewhat uh, younger than Solkovsky, but uh, Goddard was both a theorist and uh, also uh, an experimentalist. Uh, he uh, is, by many people, regarded as, as the true founder of the American space movement. Um, he worked at Clark University in Worcester, Mass. He um, developed um, liquid-fueled rockets, developed multi-stage rockets, propulsion and guidance systems, and uh, generally solved all the problems of rocketry. Many in the press regarded him as a nut, and uh, after <coughs> um, some of the bad press that he got, um, he became uh, more quiet about his work and received very little in the way of uh, public support, but nonetheless uh, had a very vigorous uh, program, and as many of you know, uh, one of the NASA centers, Goddard Space Flight Center, is named after Robert Goddard, in fact. And he lived until uh, the end, or near the end of World War II. In Germany, there was Hermann Obert, and uh, he um, was primarily a, a teacher and a, and a, a theorist, but uh, also a very uh, active writer and advocate for space exploration. And um, he uh, probably was the one who, who most influenced the development of, uh, of rocket systems, both for um, for kind of civilian use as well as for military use. One of his students was Werner von Braun. Von Braun was a um, was a, an engineer and uh, a, a passionate person about the exploration of space, um, but got his start uh, working uh, in the military side of space, as I'll talk about here. Von Braun was uh, was from a noble, minor noble family, baron, um, and uh, he was, had um, very strong uh, influence by Obert and, and the others in Germany who were advocating for the development of rocket systems. 
Um, Von Braun worked for and with um, General Walter Dornberger, who was the head of the development of the V-2 rocket system in Germany. Dornberger was, a, I believe, a major general, um, was a, a good administrator of, of these things. He developed uh, uh, programs throughout his military career. Um, there was much controversy, of course, about the development of the V-2 system, both for its um, impacts and how it was developed. Dornberger, it said, uh, taught von Braun many message, you know, m many things about how to get things done. For example, during the development of uh, some of their rocket systems, von Braun wanted to have gold-plated systems, and the the bureaucrats refused. Uh, and Dornberger said, well, what you should say is that you need really solid gold things, but you'll settle for gold-plated. And um, <laughs> and you'll get it, and Von Braun learned that lesson and, and applied it to the U.S. system when he came here. Um, the V-2 rocket system uh, was uh, developed as the, uh, what, by the Von Braun team at least, was developed as the A-4 A rocket. It was renamed the V-2, or the Vengeance 2 um, rocket uh, by the Nazis. The V-1 had been the buzz bombs. These were the uh, essentially jet-powered bombs that were um, <clears throat> lofted from uh, Germany and flown uh, over and, uh, and to London and caused uh, considerable panic amongst the population. The V-2s could carry much larger um, high explosive payloads and uh, had a, lo a longer and more accurate range. The uh, V-2s were uh, subsequently proved to be very important for research and um, I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, Von Braun uh, and his team working in Pinamunda um, again solved many of the uh, technical problems associated with rocketry and Von Braun developed not only the A4 rocket but a whole series that uh, up to and including ones large enough to loft things into Earth orbit certainly, and uh, and uh, even to put small payloads uh, into lunar orbit or to get to the moon. Um, as the end of World War II came, uh, von Braun uh, and team certainly uh, saw the writing on the wall. Von Braun uh, was quite adamant that he wanted to be captured not by the Soviet forces but by the U.S. forces. Uh, this is a picture of him in uh, 1945. His arm was uh, broken in a car accident, but he and his, uh, and his uh, inner circle sped around uh, Bavaria and southern Germany trying to find Americans to surrender to so that they uh, could work uh, on uh, future rocket systems uh, in the U.S. The uh, V-2s that were captured um, were played an important part, and so this may be a good time to mention that uh, the V-2 rockets and some slight derivatives of those were uh, used for research in the United States. The Naval Research Lab, the um, Air Force Research Laboratories, and here at the University of Colorado made use of uh, V-2 rockets to uh, perform upper atmospheric and solar research. So the Upper Air Laboratory, which is the predecessor to LAST, was uh, founded in 1948, and uh, the uh, the uh, all the teams that were using the V-2 rockets um, needed to have uh, control systems for the payloads, and so the precision um, pointing platforms, control systems that were used uh, here and by the NRL, Naval Research Lab, and Air Force Geophysics Lab. Uh, relied on the one that was developed here at, uh, at CU. And so the t a team, including uh, Stacy Jackson, IDL, and others, uh, spun off in 1954 to commercialize this pointing system, and that's what gave rise to Ball Brothers Research Corporation, which today is Ball Aerospace. The, uh, of course, uh, the rest of the history will go through a, a bit of that uh, a, a little later, but uh, there's certainly a strong tie initially, at least, to um, the V-2 rocket as giving a strong impetus to upper atmospheric and uh, solar research. 
Dan, do you know the number of V2s roughly that were made during the war and after the war? I don't know that number very accurately. Maybe somebody does. Uh, there were certainly probably hundreds made, and uh, I, I know many dozens came here to the U.S. and were used for research purposes. So James Van Allen. Um, James Van Allen uh, was uh, my advisor. I wasn't around at the time. I wasn't doing research um, with him in the early days, but. But um, he uh, w was, uh, let's see, he got his degree at uh, Wesleyan College in Iowa. He got his PhD at the University of Iowa. He uh, went um, in 1942, uh, he uh, went into the Navy and worked on proximity fuses uh, in the Navy, rose to the rank of uh, lieutenant commander, or commander, I think, and and uh, in, was discharged in 1946. Uh, he had worked uh, a little earlier before the war at the Applied Physics Laboratory in Silver Spring, Maryland. He went back to the Applied Physics Lab in 1946. And uh, there he worked on, um, on uh, auroral physics, for example, and, and he was uh, interested in using balloons. And, uh, and he eventually uh, also got involved in the use of V-2 rockets and uh, Araby rockets for doing uh, auroral research. Um, about in 1949, I believe, um, he and uh, colleagues developed a technique which was to take small rockets like this uh, Loki rocket, put them on balloons and loft the, um, the rocket to about 70,000 feet altitude and then to fire the rocket, so you could you could get a lot of scientific payload into um, into fairly high altitude without having to have a large booster or so. So these raccoons were very effective um, <clears throat> as a research tool. Uh, they could have been launched from Iowa, but uh, they were worried about these landing on some Iowans' head, and so uh, they thought there might be a better way to do this. And so uh, they, uh, Van Allen convinced the Navy to allow him to shoot these from icebreakers and other uh, naval vehicles, including long cruises uh, to and around Greenland, for example. And so he uh, got involved in that during the uh, late 40s and early 50s, and this became a very <coughs> successful research program for him. And his uh, primary detection technique for his rocket systems was to use Geiger-Muller tubes for, uh, as the basic detectors. And uh, this, this research program um, and the involvement in rockets uh, really made him well known in the rocket community. In about uh, 1954, now let's go back to Von Braun and company, they went, they were uh, eventually moved um, to Von Braun and a core team of uh, expert German uh, rocketeers were moved to the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama, the, uh, what is now the Marshall, or part of the Marshall, Marshall Space Flight Center is part of the Redstone Arsenal. But anyway, uh, Von Braun and company were working on rockets there, and by 1954 or 55, they had uh, developed uh, major uh, launch systems. During this, uh, this period of time, the whole enterprise for both the United States and the Soviet Union was to marry um, hydrogen nuclear weapons with rocket systems to form intercontinental ballistic missiles that were uh, the mainstay of the Cold War period. And uh, von Braun's interest was less in uh, developing ICBMs than it was in launching things into space. He was passionate about getting a satellite into orbit as soon as possible. And uh, he uh, felt, shouldn't there be someone somewhere, some scientist that they could co-opt into uh, getting involved in the scientific side of rocketry? One of Von Braun's uh, colleagues there had worked with Van Allen at White Sands. And so he said he would talk to Dr. Van Allen, and Van Allen um, then agreed to develop a payload system for the uh, the Redstone, or what became the Jupiter uh, C or Juno launch vehicle, and have that ready to go. 
Now, a key event uh, that preceded this and, and was uh, instrumental in the whole plan to put satellites in space was uh, another thing that involved Van Allen. Uh, this was a meeting that was held in his home. He was still um, in Silver Spring at this time. Uh, he went to the University of Iowa, I believe in 51, to take up the head of department, physics and astronomy department at Iowa, but in, uh, he was still in, in Silver Spring in 1950. And uh, there, there was a meeting held at his house attended by Lord uh, Lloyd uh, Berkner, Sidney Chapman, uh, Harry Vestine, Fred Singer. Uh, these were some of the movers and shakers in geosciences at that time. And they laid out a plan to have another of the international years, but the previous ones in 1882-83, which of course was very important, and 1932-33, Admiral Byrd and so on, uh, another of these polar years, but instead they defined an international geophysical year, much more sophisticated, much more elaborate, uh, with much broader intentions for a comprehensive study of the uh, Earth and its uh, interactions with uh, in space. So there were 11 different Earth science domains that were sketched out for this IGY, and this would be held then in 57-58 uh, was the plan. And this, of course, had the political backing and the uh, high scientific backing to become a, a major enterprise. And so the announcement was made that there would be um, a, uh, in there was a general consensus among that group that Earth satellites should be among the tools that would be used in the IGY. It was formally announced by uh, President Eisenhower's press secretary, Haggerty, uh, in July of 1955 that the <coughs> U.S. would launch a small Earth satellite for the um, IGY. Um, and this, was, this would be uh, a civilian program. It would be based in the Naval Research Laboratory. They would run the effort, but it would be uh, using a Vanguard launch vehicle, not a military satellite, but more of a, or a launch vehicle, not a rocket, uh, developed explicitly for military purpose, but rather one for civilian purpose. And um, the, uh, this would be uh, done as a civilian program. Um, Von Braun was, I, as I understand, hopping mad about the, uh, the rule that this would be, be delayed until the IGY and that uh, it would be uh, based on the Vanguard system rather than um, his uh, series of developed rockets, which uh, he felt were ready to go at this time. Um, he was developing multi-stage, Von Braun and team were developing multi-stage rockets um, at, as uh, early as 55, 54, 55. Um, they were uh, ready to go and Von Braun vowed that he could be ready to launch a satellite in 60 days or so. Um, this uh, alarmed the um, politicians. The situation in 55 was that uh, they were ready to go. The uh, third stage for the Redstone rockets had been developed, but Eisenhower was adamant that the U.S. would not be the first one to launch an Earth satellite. Um, the Soviet territory was huge, was vast, and there were all kinds of assertions from the Soviets at that time that they had uh, ICBMs, uh, large numbers of ICBMs spread throughout their territory. And it was uh, virtually impossible for the U.S. To, um, to get a good look at what was going on over that vast territory. So Eisenhower wanted to establish a principle of open space or open skies so that uh, it was permissible to overfly the territory and uh, to thereby use um, sophisticated reconnaissance techniques to see what the real story was as far as missile bases uh, spread over uh, otherwise inaccessible territory. So that the, uh, the U.S. Uh, needed to have these reconnaissance satellites to monitor the IB ICBM numbers and, and capabilities. Um, Von Braun was, um, was nonetheless ready to go. Let's see here. Okay. And so um, the the Eisenhower administration sent people down to watch every time there was a missile test involving the, uh, the Von Braun rocket systems, just so there was no accidental launch of a, uh, a satellite into space. And uh, 
that more than once they found that there might have been, uh, let's say, conditions might have been right to put something like the third stage into orbit, and uh, this was uh, guarded against. So this brings us to the uh, to what we uh, I know a little bit about the Soviet side. For those of you who had a chance to read the Physics Today article in the December issue, um, last December issue, um, there was quite an interesting parallel story going on in the Soviet Union. This is Sergei Korolev, um, who uh, was uh, a tremendous engineer, a, a great, uh, a great uh, designer of uh, rocket uh, vehicles. Uh, he was the one who he was not known in the West, as I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, but he was the, uh, the driving engine for the Soviet development of uh, large throw weight uh, rocket vehicles. To the surprise of, of many people who um, uh, had not expected this, the Soviets launched on October 4th the uh, first Earth satellite, Sputnik 1. This was little more than a radio beacon, but it showed that the Russian ICBMs could uh, place an object into space, and um, by extension, that they could probably place a nuclear weapon anywhere on, on the Earth that they wanted to. And so uh, it caused uh, virtual panic throughout the US and Western populations that this, um, this had occurred. And uh, the question was, why had the US not um, been the first one to launch into space and from what I just told you about the Eisenhower administration's policy uh, this is a partial explanation of, of why that was. Um, this, uh, the uh, Soviets um, were very secretive about their space uh, accomplishments until they were accomplished but uh, Korolev was known only as the chief designer in the West. Uh, he, uh, he had been imprisoned in the uh, Stalinist times, um, and uh, despite uh, all the political, um, let's say, retributions and so on, he still was uh, passionate about serving uh, to uh, always come up with a new major uh, achievement on demand. But his name and his face were basically kept a national secret for security reasons, I suppose. And uh, he died in 1966 during routine surgery, died on the, on the uh, <laughs> surgical table. And he was essentially unknown and unsung in the West. But uh, his, uh, his achievements were um, truly stunning during the period that he was active. Now, um, he, was, he uh, knew and was friends with uh, his own scientist. Uh, this is Sergei Vernoff, who was a professor at Moscow State University. Uh, Vernoff uh, had talked to Korolev about their plan to launch an Earth satellite, and, and Vernoff wanted to have instrumentation on board the first uh, Earth satellite to be launched by the Soviet Union. Uh, he was, uh, Vernoff, it is said, was completely surprised by the fact that um, such a simple uh, spacecraft was launched um, when it was on October 4th, and uh, that it uh, uh, that he hadn't been told about it and wasn't given the opportunity to put any instrumentation on board. But he uh, he prevailed on Korolev to uh, put instrumentation on the second Sputnik. This was launched on, on the 3rd of November on the eve of the um, Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, this was um, a much more sophisticated spacecraft. It, uh, it had a number of experiments. This is the uh, housing in which the dog Laika was launched into space, for example. Uh, but it also had on board uh, a uh, cosmic ray package from Sergei Vernoff and his team. And it was, uh, again, based on Geiger-Muller tube uh, kind of technology. Now, the thing about uh, this being a secretive program and Sputnik 2 being launched uh, by the Soviet Union uh, with, and the data were encoded, the apogee wasn't over the Soviet Union. Uh, it was only real-time uh, real data available in the Soviet Union tracking stations. But the data were mostly recorded and, uh, excuse me, they were mostly downloaded. There was not recording in, the first, uh, in this first instance. The data, down-linked uh, data were encoded, and uh, the apogee was over Australia. 
The Australians recorded the data and demanded from the Soviets the code to interpret the data. The Soviets refused. The Soviets demanded the data from the Australians and the Australians refused. And, and so the Vernoff belts faded into oblivion. Um, the, I'll tell you more about that, that fading in a little bit too, but the, um, the next um, reaction uh, we know about public reactions, I suppose. Um, the, with the panic that set in with the launch of Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2, the Eisenhower administration then tried to accelerate the pace of launch of the U.S. zone satellite system. And uh, they went to the Vanguard uh, team uh, the, on the 6th of December of 57. They, launched, they attempted to launch the uh, Vanguard TV-3 mission. It failed pretty spectacularly on ignition. It got about four meters high. Uh, it was called Kaputnik uh, by the, in the press. Uh, but it really uh, opened the door for sort of any, uh, any uh, thing that might work. And uh, Von Braun um, said, oh, I can do that, you know, in, in uh, 30 days or so. So Dan, just an interruption. Of course, you, with Eisenhower's idea of open skies, this was fully televised. And I watched the event oh, myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it was quite a spectacular thing that millions of Americans saw happen. And it was a spectacular Failure. Failure. <laughs> um, there were many spectacular failures during the early part of the space age. Uh, if For those uh, more secretive ones, I don't know if you've ever seen the series of Discoverer launches, but ten in a row that failed and they still kept uh, trying to get their reconnaissance satellites launched. But yeah, it's really quite amazing. So, um, so the uh, Von Braun was given the, the go-ahead and um, and so this, I'll go back to this picture now. This is the cover, or this uh, lead picture. So this is Von Braun, of course, who developed the uh, launch vehicle, the Juno uh, 1 or Jupiter C uh, launch vehicle that uh, launched this into space. This is the model of the Explorer uh, 1 or the engineering model, really. Uh, on the left, uh, your left, Van Allen's right, is William Pickering, who was the director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at that time. And here, somewhat height challenged, is uh, Van Allen, who uh, is uh, is uh, will develop the uh, sensor system. And so this was uh, this spacecraft was launched at 10:48 uh, Eastern Standard Time on the 31st of January. It was actually technically, uh, according to UT, was launched on the 1st of February. But this is take a picture taken in the Great Hall of the National Academy. And uh, it was the celebration uh, by these guys of a successful launch of the spacecraft uh, into uh, Earth orbit. I, just as a comment, uh, I, I later in later times, I actually I met Van Allen, of course, who's my advisor. Uh, I talked to him occasionally, um, and um, I met Van, Von Braun. I, as I recall, it was uh, Van Allen set something up and George Ludwig made it possible when I went to NASA headquarters uh, this, uh, before uh, Von's, Von Braun's death in 77, so I was probably a student or so. I remember him as being an imperious man who um, seemed like uh, I was probably wasting his time, but he told me to reach for the stars and uh, <laughs> here we are. His um, wife was very nice. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, Pickering was, uh, was uh, I, I met subsequently when I was at Caltech and uh, had uh, a couple of dinners with him. Uh, he was a very gracious uh, guy and uh, uh, I could understand that this team you know, would have been an excellent group of people to work with and uh, very ambitious each in their way. So the Explorer 1 spacecraft was uh, launched uh, successfully and uh, it was a pretty simple vehicle, as I, I don't know if you guys can see through me or you can see okay. Um, and so uh, it, it had a, a, a number of uh, things they were concerned about, micrometeorites and, and stuff like that, but they had the cosmic ray package here, and as I say, this was pretty simple stuff, uh, Geiger tubes, to um, make the uh, essential uh, scientific measurements. Now, this is a, a much told story, but uh, the first data that they got back, it was you know, just bits and pieces of data, but the chunks of data in uh, 
over you know maybe an hour or two of blocks of data and what they found what they had expected was they'd be able to watch the uh, increase some slight increase in cosmic ray intensity as they rose in altitude and uh, instead what they saw was sort of things going along rather normally here then the uh, counting rates would rise to a very high level plateau and then they would drop essentially to zero then they'd come back plateau and then drop down to more expected levels and they were uh, very puzzled by this behavior uh, not sure at all what this uh, what could really be going on and uh, they were uh, they were pretty flummoxed by it but this was the team of uh, people who were working with Van Allen on this project at that time and uh, this is Carl McElwain many of you may know Carl who uh, was uh, is a great scientist and uh, has had a very distinguished career subsequently at the University of California San Diego uh, this is Van Allen of course this is uh, George Ludwig George was more of an engineer um, and uh, developed uh, data systems for the um, for the vehicles and worked on the basic sensor systems this was the only other faculty member who worked with Van Allen at that time this is Ernie Ray who was I think an assistant professor in physics and astronomy at the University of Iowa and uh, McElwain decided or speculated that perhaps the counting rates were very high and that the detector system might be behaving that way because of very high counting rates. So he took uh, one of the Geiger Mueller tube systems to the laboratory and tested it under extreme radiation and uh, in irradiation. And, and what he concluded was that was re what was really happening here was that the, um, the uh, uh, Geiger tube was being subjected to extremely intense uh, high energy radiation and that was uh, the uh, going to falling to zero was actually a paralysis of the electronic system on board the uh, the spacecraft and that uh, there must be immensely high radiation that was essentially uh, just uh, completely saturating the detector system so they uh, this was uh, agreed to be the interpretation they subsequently <coughs> uh, tried to launch Explorer 2 it failed Explorer 3 um, had on board um, a, a tape recorder that was devised by um, by George Ludwig and so they were able to da uh, record data continuously uh, and uh, what they uh, let me go back so uh, what they found was that uh, indeed that they, there were uh, periods of low uh, intensity then they would go through periods where there was very high counting rates and um, and then uh, they would fall to low values again um, this picture was probably developed about that time for the publication of these results in May of, uh, of 1958 um, as we report in our physics today article with Panasiuk um, the US was probably given where it launched from was probably uh, initially detecting the inner radiation zone the inner Van Allen belt the uh, Soviets uh, as I'll talk about subsequently also eventually got their data and um, they uh, they uh, saw this kind of behavior in their detector system and they uh, noted that there had been a small solar flare that had occurred about this time and so they speculated that this variation changing in intensities was due to solar particles when in retrospect it's uh, very likely that they were also detecting the fringes of the um, radiation belts uh, but the um, they were most likely because of the higher latitudes for their spacecraft were probably detecting electrons associated with the outer belt so the joke, at the, uh, I'm told by Panacea, uh, the joke at the time was that there had to be an inner and an outer zone, an inner U.S. radiation zone, an outer Soviet zone separated by a demilitarized zone <laughs> in between. So um, Van Allen uh, and team reported uh, the, that the Earth was uh, shrouded in, uh, in uh, high intensity radiation, the radiation belts. And uh, this guy, Ernie Ray, when, when McElwain and, and he uh, determined what was really going on, they left a famous note on Van Allen's door that space is radioactive. And, uh, and in a sense, that's uh, probably true. 
Uh, so Van Allen uh, was uh, was heralded, was uh, was lauded, and um, he appeared uh, twice on the cover of Time magazine. This what year is that? This is this is in '59, I think May of '59. Um, but uh, he um, he reported that uh, there had been a lot of interest in uh, in their work, and uh, I found this recounting from him a very, a very so says a lot about him. But anyway, he said, following our May first of May report and news conference, we received many inquiries for further details. One that lingers in my memory is the following telephone conversation. Quote, this is John Lear, a science editor of the Saturday Review of Literature calling from New York. Heavy emphasis on calling from New York. Then a long pause waiting for me to recover from the thrill of hearing from such an important person <laughs> in New York, no less. <laughs> Actually, I did know who he was and it often characterized him as the anti-science editor of the Saturday Review. <laughs> He continued, I read of your recent report of discovery of radiation belts of the Earth, and I thought I would do a piece on this subject. What I found remarkable was that such important work had been done at a Midwestern State University. <laughs> Heavy emphasis on Midwestern State University. Well, I told him, I, I don't think I responded with any actual profanity, but I did manage to convey a suggestion as to what he could do with his piece and hung up. <laughs> the next day, the president of my university, Virgil M. Hancher, called me to report that Mr. Lear had called him to complain about my discourtesy. I then gave a brief explanation of my reaction, at the end of which Hancher replied, I promised Lear that I would call you, and you may now consider that I have done so. And by the way, Van, my congratulations. I never heard from the matter again. It's great to have a boss like that. <laughs> Van Allen was, was uh, throughout all the, all the uh, honors and glories and stuff, he, he, was, uh, he remained very unassuming. Um, I was in his presence one when, once when a reporter asked him, what are the Van Allen belts good for? And he said, they hold up Van Allen's pants. Uh, <laughs> um, another time, we had, there was a planetary encounter, and every, all the reporters wanted to talk only to Van Allen, and we were all sort of backed up against the wall, and the reporter said, what do you have to say on this suspicious occasion? He said, I just had a great pizza. <laughs> so so uh, he, he was, I, I think he disliked very much the pomposity that many of the other scientists uh, sometimes exhibited. Uh, before the ink was even dry on the, um, the scientific papers announcing the uh, formation of, or the, the existence of radiation belts around the Earth, um, there was another uh, storyline going on, and that was that uh, the uh, folks at the Livermore Laboratory in California, um, uh, before they knew there was natural trapped radiation, had speculated that one could explode nuclear weapons in space one could load up the magnetic field lines with immensely high intensities of uh, fission electrons. And um, those fission electrons would be almost an impenetrable shield against uh, ICBMs. And so uh, this team was led by Nicholas Christophilus, a, a Greek uh, engineer and scientist. And uh, Christophilus uh, had this idea to do nuclear explosions and to load up the magnetic field and thereby fry any kind of uh, uh, ICBMs that might try to fly through it. So Van Allen and uh, I think uh, Ludwig, the whole team, were read into this program called the Argus uh, program. And uh, the idea was to uh, test the idea of whether nuclear bombs could uh, produce uh, pulses or tra a trapped population of electrons. So there were three uh, Argus shots. These were uh, relatively small fission-driven uh, weapons. Uh, these were all about 1.4 kilotons. And they were uh, launched, uh, they were shot off in August through September of 58. Well, uh, in order to prepare for this, uh, uh, George Ludwig and Van Allen were asked to develop a, uh, a new spacecraft, uh, the Explorer 4 which was instrumented specifically to look for the effects of, of trapped fission electrons. Fission electrons, as you know, extend up to relatively high energy. And uh, 
before you exceed the MHD limits, you can trap a, a very high intensity. So these, uh, these shots were fired. The Explorer 4 uh, program was authorized in late May of 58, and it launched in July of uh, 58. So uh, looking at the experimentalists around the room, I hope you're properly awed by the idea that people could go from a concept to a, a, a completed uh, system in the period of about a month or so. It's, uh, to me, it's uh, still a remarkable thing. Anyway, they, uh, they were able to uh, study this effect. They were able, able to see these uh, intense uh, spikes of trapped electrons on the field lines where the bomb burst had occurred. And um, the, uh, the, Ar the Argus tests proved quite conclusively that the Christophilus effect was a valid one. Van Allen was asked about being involved in such, such work, and uh, he, instead of uh, reacting negatively about this, um, at that time at least, he said that this, this was one of the greatest uh, experiments uh, of uh, geophysical nature that had ever been performed. Um, for those of you who saw an earlier talk I gave about, uh, about three years later, uh, four years later, the starfish uh, explosion uh, occurred, and the starfish explosion wasn't uh, in the kiloton range, it was in the uh, megaton, uh, multi-megaton range. That explosion uh, loaded up the inner belt with probably 10 million, maybe 100 million times the natural radiation level and altered the Van Allen belts for a decade thereafter, but uh, at least this initial sort of modest Argus tests proved that the that the uh, field lines could be uh, could efficiently and effectively trap fission electrons uh, as well as the natural electrons. What would be the impact on current satellite systems? Or something? Yeah, that's a great question, Glenn. Um, in the uh, going back to the 1962 experience, there were uh, probably a couple of dozen spacecraft in orbit at that time. Um, after the uh, U.S. Uh, exploded the Starfish weapon. The Soviets followed with uh, two, I think it was two, maybe three, uh, similarly sized weapons, and the entire inner belt was loaded to this huge degree. A dozen of those spacecraft failed over the next uh, two months, essentially, a month and a half. So um, today there are over 1,700 spacecraft in orbit, and if we and many of those are in low Earth orbit. So uh, another starfish kind of event would probably wipe out a uh, border. I would guess many hundreds of spacecraft, and many of them that we rely on very heavily for many practical uh, utilitarian, uh, utilitarian purposes. So uh, I'd be happy to come back and give uh, a talk about anthropogenic space weather sometime. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, you know, I, I won't go on too much longer here. I just want to say that. Uh, Subsequent to uh, this, uh, there were there was a, a lot of there were a lot of papers, as this indicates, Van Allen and many many other people published about the Argus tests and published about the Starfish tests and stuff like that, and uh, they they really developed a, a preliminary understanding of what the uh, morphology of the radiation belts were, and uh, and then people moved on to studying lower energy particles, plasma effects, field effects. Uh, going on to the other planets, many other exploratory things, and so they're uh, sort of uh, developed a uh, well. We we know enough about the Earth's Van Allen belts, and uh, and so people sort of moved on. I remember back in the 80s uh, being in sessions that consisted of like four people, maybe Bill Imhoff, Joe Reagan, Bernie Blake, and myself in a broom closet at AGU talking to each other about radiation belt science, but the uh, there was a, quite a resurgence with the Crest mission and then the Sampex mission, I think, really stimulated a lot of interest. And so the uh, Van Allen probes mission was called the Radiation Belt Storm Probes, was launched in um, August, late August of uh, 2012. And uh, right away, we found a lot of interesting things that really hadn't been very well uh, understood. The uh, existence of multiple belts, three belt kind of structure. For example, the uh, remnants of previous acceleration events staying in this, what we call the relativistic electron storage ring. This was reported in Science and made a fair splash. And we also have uh, had a whole host of other things which are beyond the scope of this, but I would say that, that the beginning of the space age, the, uh, 
the efforts of the Soviets to launch the Sputniks and especially uh, Van Allen and team to um, persistently pursue the question of what was going on with uh, trapped radiation around the Earth has set in motion uh, what we can now regard as you know the the scientific space age and uh, and we've now found that uh, all the magnetized planets in one way or another have comparable kind of uh, radiation around them so I think it's been quite an impressive uh, 60 years and uh, I hope that there will be at least 60 more years of uh, studying this so thank you very much Soviets, they missed out on the discovery of the radiation belts. Was there any change in the way the Soviets did science when they realized that on an international stage they're missing out on the sort of publicity? I think if it changed things, it uh, was a long time in coming. Uh, their, I think their space program was built very much around it being military uh, and uh, very secretive. And, uh, and despite the uh, disappointment. Um, there remained until the end of the Cold War great strictures about scientists traveling, about exchange of information, and uh, and uh, you know the they only got a hold of the uh, Sputnik 2 data about the same time that Van Allen had all published their results, and and then they of course uh, looked at their more sophisticated data, and with Sputnik 3 even more so, they were put, able to put together the picture and explain that there were electrons in the outer belt and protons in the inner belt and stuff like that. But, um, but my understanding is that uh, even, and maybe Juan can comment, but there, there were very few Soviet scientists who got out to international meetings even much later, so Juan? An interesting uh, uh, situation of ground-based space measurements happened after the Argus mm -hmm. experiments, mm -hmm. which were kept very successfully, uh, successfully, very secret. Yeah, yeah. The 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 explosions were, I mean, the the, the detonations were in the southern hemisphere, yeah. over the southern Atlantic. Right. So nobody could see anything yeah. Yeah. except that there was a little bit of aurora over the Azores, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is kind of strange. <laughs> but anyway, right, it, it right. wasn't interpreted. Yeah. But Valeria Troitskaya had a network to study micropulsation, well, magnetic field variations and micropulsations all along the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And she saw perturbations propagate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, uh, from what she told me, is that they had already uh, knowledge that you could trap particles in, 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 in the Earth's magnetic field. And she correctly interpreted mm, that. Mm, mm. And the military in the Soviet Union right. were astounded how <laughs> the civilian yeah. Uh, yeah. geophysicists <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, could, with a ground-based measurement that yeah. only dealt with pure science, <laughs> discover such an important thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, my sense was that many uh, who who weren't part of the military uh, apparatus knew very little. You know, weren't weren't very engaged Absolutely at all. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. And the same happened much later when Reagan invented the what yeah. really was the Singer invention yeah. of a shield. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in in eighty three, yeah. uh, they were so desperate, the military, yeah. that they had to go back to the uh, civilian scientists in Izmiran, in Iki and in all its institutes, and beg them for information about particle trapping and so on. See, scientists are important, <laughs> <laughs> or can be valuable. So. Other questions? Yes. I had heard the story that to keep the Eisenhower people off base and make it seem like they're not progressing, Ron Braun told his people to take their work to their garages? That, probably, that sounds uh, consistent with some of the things I've heard. That uh, He certainly tried to, he would direct them toward what was supposed to be the next vehicle, but it was just a dummy thing while they were really working on something else elsewhere. He, <laughs> he, he was in constant uh, uh, deception mode to try to keep them off his back and, and uh, to allow his, you know, his team's work to go forward. And, uh, 
I, you know, I, I, uh, the Vanguard um, had a, a small, something probably like Sputnik or so, a grapefruit-sized little transmitter or something like that. And I think we should be so, so pleased in a way that it was really the Von Braun and Van Allen and Pickering team that got something because that, that really launched the, the scientific, uh, uh, scientific age. Other questions? Yes. Could you comment more on Eisenhower? He's, he's, it sounded like he was reluctant to put up a satellite for fear of the Russians, but was it that or that he wanted to have the proper satellite to look for missiles? Um, it wasn't, well, it was fear of the Soviets, but for a different reason. It was fear of uh, that if they really had the dozens or hundreds, in some accounts, of ICBMs with you know, nuclear tipped ICBMs. Um, Khrushchev, or you know, his predecessor, I guess it was probably Khrushchev, who, who was saying, we've got all these weapons, you, you know, you better really, uh, we better be careful in Europe and Berlin and stuff like that. And so there was uh, considerable doubt uh, during that period of time whether that was really true, but nobody really knew because nobody had been able to survey the entire Soviet territory. So what Eisenhower and his advisors wanted was to be able to send satellites over to have uh, camera systems and to be able to photograph essentially all the territory. So, uh, so just to make that crystal clear, that was what they were really after was the, uh, this was a, a part of law that was, was untested, whether it was, that you knew that you couldn't fly, you know, you couldn't fly over uh, in airspace over um, uh, enemy territory, but uh, was it true that that extended uh, into space, or could you really fly at higher altitude? Was it permissible? Well, if the Soviets were the ones who first did that, were overflying U.S. territory, then by reciprocation, the U.S. had the right to fly over the Soviet territory, okay. and that that was the uh, open skies or uh, principle. So they were adamant. They were they were absolutely adamant that it wouldn't be the U.S. that first did that. It would really be the Soviets who first did that. Once that was done, then it was permissible for the U.S. to launch. And the U.S. then uh, had embarked, had had begun uh, earlier to plan for, and had embarked on a, a system of launching these uh, first film systems that would take film, and eventually they would uh, uh, kick the film canisters out. Airplanes would fly and catch them in nets, and, and they would then, uh, you know, interp interpret the data. And uh, as I mentioned, I think in response to Larry's remark, uh, there were, um, you know, many. There were ten at least failures in a row, and the and the uh, the predecessor to the National Reconnaissance Office uh, kept on trying. They kept on until they got it right, and and uh, they then um, uh, successfully. Uh, showed that, that there were at most a, f a few ICBM installations, not the dozens or hundreds that had been alleged. So it was very important. So was some of the alarm uh, with the launch of Sputnik feigned then? I mean, it sounds like there's actually, no. there would be relief. Uh, because people didn't know this whole story. In fact, many people today still don't know why, why was the U.S. Uh, the, uh, you know, the U.S. thought of itself after World War II as the preeminent uh, technical uh, you know, a nation in the world, and uh, and how could they be beaten by anybody else? And so it's called the Sputnik moment, or so, you know, something that just uh, wakes people up. Well, people thought that the U.S. had been trying as hard as it could, and that it had failed to win the space race, and therefore, and moreover, that um, our sworn Cold War enemy had these large throwaway rockets that could put uh, missiles anywhere uh, on the surface of the Earth. And so it was just a, an existential threat to, uh, to our Western society, to the U.S., and uh, that had thought of itself as being relatively isolated and immune to that. So I don't think the, the press was in a fear. The press becomes that way sometimes, you know? <laughs> and, and I would say that the, uh, the people uh, of the United States who didn't know the real story just believed that, right. that we, were, we were in second place. But but those who did know the real story, probably a relief, I think, right? In the open yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Eisenhower administration was uh, was relieved for a nanosecond, and and then when when the press started saying, "You guys have been asleep at the wheel, and why haven't you? You know, why uh, why did you lose the space race? And uh, how could you possibly have botched this? And our existence is at stake here." 
uh, they immediately then had to go to, into the uh, hurry up mode and uh, that's when Vanguard blew up and, and the door opened for, for Von Braun. So, yeah, well. The uh, value for uh, Soviet propaganda yeah. of the first launch yeah. was probably not at all uh, uh, guessed or That's predicted right. or so in That's this right. country. That's right. But I, w I was living in Argentina at that time, and the, the impact on the population yeah. suddenly, oh, the Soviet Union, yeah. science, and yeah. so on. Yeah. I, at that time, I happened to be in the U.S. I was working in, uh, with the Bevatron. I was, for some reason, driving through the desert of Nevada <laughs> when the radio, I was listening to mm -hmm. the radio, announced the launch of Sputnik 1. Yeah. And what I was almost terrified at the fact that the first question of all the reporters in the U.S. was, what kind of uh, um, fuel do they have <laughs> to keep the satellite <laughs> power? <laughs> that I couldn't believe. <laughs> uh, people didn't understand <laughs> orbital <laughs> mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> it's got it's got the education system. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But, but I mean, I, I think that uh, people, I, I, it's probably fair to say people were panic stricken uh, by, the, yeah. by the, whole, the whole thing. And this, is, uh, this, of course, subsequently led to um, uh, self-examination that we were behind in math and science. And, we, and, uh, and there, you know, this, is, uh, this led to uh, in huge infusions of money into education systems. And a lot of people went to college to become engineers or scientists because of this. And, and so, I mean, there, were, there was a lot of fallout, <coughs> you know, from this. But um, it, all, it all was predicated on the assumption that we were in a race and we were, uh, it was a race we were trying to win, not when we were trying to come in second place. Maybe Kim Jong-un can help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but, you know, what he's probably going to help with is, is recognize that uh, starfish uh, knocked out a lot of technical capabilities back then, and, a, and another starfish would be asymmetrically so devastating to the West compared to him. That, yeah, yeah. So, but, I remember as a youth being told to dive under a desk for drills. Was that done regularly before Sputnik, or did it intensify after, or was it something that had been going on all along that people were having drills and diving? Under? Well, ICBMs were, had been in development, uh, but I, I think that it was after that time that, that it was really recognized that these were sufficiently powerful to place uh, weapons anywhere on the surface of the Earth. So I think the, the late uh, 50s and, and 60s were the time when it was really recognized that full-scale thermonuclear war would be possible. But uh, of course, the, the marrying of the, of the rockets with nuclear weapons was sort of the defining moment for that whole period of time for the Cold War. Mutual assured destruction and all that stuff really emerged from that period. Any other questions? Anybody in the third or fourth row have any questions? <laughs> anyway, I hope that this little history has been of some interest, and we'll see uh, see uh, how this celebration goes both here and abroad. Okay. All right, both okay. Thanks, thank, thank you. Thank you.